the children that can only teach you what you need to worry about. The video and microphone from the live, which will be important. I will ask you to tell them the video and keep them up until I teach you. When I share, you will ask to share the slides. Uh, does anyone have any videos? So when I share, when I share, I'll come up on the line. Okay. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session uh, of Palace 2020. Uh, I hope you're all uh, excited to see uh, this morning's set of talks. So, uh, just as usual, just a few housekeeping things. So, uh, during the talks, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. Uh, if you have any connection issues uh, at all, then you can hit click the reconnect button along the top. And hopefully that'll reconnect you and uh, the, the slides and, uh, and all the video should be coming back in fine as well. So uh, without further ado, uh, our first talk this morning is by Alexander Zafis. We'll be talking about the ever browsing uh, Dinotheria Day. Did climate change affect conservative herbivory during the Miocene? So I'm just gonna load up the, load up the slides. So there you go, take it away, Alexandros. I think you're, uh, Alexandros, I think you still might be muted. Um, can you speak again? Okay, I can't hear you. We're going to start now. You just watch what goes on in terms of the fingers that I gave the warnings, the child warnings. I don't know what happened. Uh, so minutes, I'll give you three hello, hello? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Great. Sorry. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, greetings from Vienna. Uh, today I will present to you a small part of my PhD thesis, which was uh, recently defended. And uh, the story I will tell you today uh, revolves around the Miocene, which chronologically expands from approximately 23 to 5 million years ago. Now, the Miocene constitutes one of the most important epochs of the Cenozoic due to its um, uh, high tectonic and uh, volcanic activity, which subsequently led to some very important uh, climatic shifts. And uh, one of the most important climatic shifts of the Miocene is the so-called mid-Miocene climatic optimum, which constitutes the warmest time interval of the last 23 million years. Now, this climatic optimum was followed by a short uh, cooling period within the Middle Miocene, known as the Mid-Miocene Climatic Transition. And this transition continued until the end of uh, the epoch, triggering the so-called Late Miocene Grassland Expansion. Now, according to the fossil record, we know that uh, these climatic shifts played a very important role in the diversification of mammalian communities. And uh, to be more specific, during the mid-Miocene climatic optimum, we had the um, adaptive radiation of families such as tragolids, paleomericids, suids, and primates. While later, during the late Miocene grassland expansion, we have the adaptive radiation of equids, bovids, giraffids, and proboscidians, which is the group that uh, my presentation will focus on today. Now, proboscidians today are represented by uh, three modern taxa, the Indian elephant, the African bush elephant, and the smaller African forest elephant. However, even though we have only three representatives today, the order is uh, the order of uh, Proboscidea is considered a very diverse order since it chronologically expands from Paleocene to today, of course, and um, showed a high diversification since uh, the Miocene. Now, uh, that was the time when a rather peculiar uh, group of uh, Proboscidians uh, appeared, which is uh, known as the family Dinotheride, and it's an extinct group which appeared in European paleo environments in the early Miocene and got extinct at the end of uh, the latest Miocene. The family Dinotheridae includes large to very large animals with a proboscidian-like skeleton and a pair of very characteristic uh, lower tusks that are positioned exclusively in the lower jaw. From the map here, you can see that uh, 
Dinotherids were a rather diverse group in municipal environments of uh, Africa and uh, Eurasia. However, even though we have a plethora of uh, fossil remains of dinotherids, there are only two uh, recognized taxa, the smaller and uh, older prodinotherium, and the younger and larger uh, dinotherium. Dinotherids migrated from uh, Africa towards Eurasia during the early Miocene through a natural corridor known as the Gomphotherium uh, land bridge. And some brief paleoecological analyses um, showed that dinotherids were conservative browsers. Now, what that means is that uh, these animals, dinotherids, were browsers, which means that they were feeding on soft leaves and twigs throughout their evolutionary history. However, sorry. However, this uh, statement uh, implies that the dinotherids were not affected whatsoever but by these very, very dramatic shifts that took place, uh, dramatic climatic shifts that took place uh, during the Miocene. And therefore, the question that uh, triggered this uh, very study was whether abiotic factors, and in this case, climate, affected the paleo diets of dinotherids, and if so, how? Now, in order to answer uh, this question, I employed a multi-proxy uh, analysis using dental uh, wear studies. And um, the first method that I used is uh, dental microwear analysis. To be more specific, I employed low magnification stereo microscopy. And therefore, with only 35 times magnification, I analyzed and quantified uh, dental wear features, which are scratches and pits of different sizes found on uh, enamel surfaces of teeth. For my general approach and analysis, I used the uh, generalized methodology uh, established by Solinas and Seberborn 2002 and Seberborn and others 2004. However, for the sampling uh, protocol, I employed the protocol by Xafis and others 2017. And therefore, I boosted my sample size by including both premolars and molars in my sample. For the interpretation of my data, I used this rather simple uh, plot you can see here, which is nothing but a simple uh, scatter plot of scratches versus pits with those two uh, distinct morphospaces. The left morphospace represents the browsing morphospace and the smaller morphospace on the right represents the grazing morphospace. Now these two confidence ellipses were, based, were created based on potential uh, modern analogs through a data set that I uh, created from scratch which included both proboscidian and other herbivore angular taxa. The second method that I used is dental measureware analysis. And since I was uh, dealing with proboscidians, I employed uh, the methodology of measureware angles, which was established, established by Juha Sarinen in 2015. Now, based on this method, I measured uh, reliefs of uh, worn enamel uh, ridges. And for the interpretation of my data, I created another comparative data set, which included uh, angles from teeth of all three modern elephant taxa. Now, based on this uh, methodology, uh, measureware angles that are uh, very close to 90 degrees represent clear browsing uh, animals. And from then on, the higher the angle, the more abrasive the diet, basically. Now, microware represents the so-called last supper effect, which means that the image that we get from uh, microware represents the last meals of an animal uh, prior to its death. However, uh, the measureware analysis show us a deep time uh, signal. So what we get is the lifetime signal of uh, di the dietary habits of an animal. And by combining these two methodologies, we get more precise results since we get um, uh, data from two different time scales of an animal's life. Now for my analysis, I reconstructed the diets of European uh, dinotherids, including approximately 350 dental wear samples from 86 localities of 14 uh, European countries. And this to date is the most comprehensive paleoecological study uh, for the family dinotherid. I performed both a taxon-based and a time-based analysis. 
First, I performed a taxon-based analysis because I wanted to see whether my results are uh, consistent with the results that you can find in the literature. And in fact, they were. I could see that both Prodinotherium and Dinotherium seem to be uh, browsing taxa. They, they're, the data are plotting very close to the browsing morphospace. And uh, apart from that, I could see that their two confidence ellipses are overlapping a lot, which means that the two taxa had also very, very similar dietary habits. Then I performed the time-based analysis by correlating uh, my dental wear data with paleo temperatures. Now, first I tried to correlate my measure wear angles with uh, paleo temperatures, but I didn't see any significant pattern. Pattern, However, as you can see uh, here from the uh, yellow line, which represents my measure wear angles, you can see that my angles are fluctuating between 82 and 92 degrees, which are on the lowest spectrum. And therefore my deep time signal for dinotherids is in agreement with uh, the last supper uh, signal that I got from uh, my macro wear results. However, when I tried to correlate my microwave results with paleo temperatures, I could see that uh, uh, there was a very interesting uh, response and uh, more specifically a negative correlation. And uh, you can see, for example, that uh, it seems like during warmer intervals, such as the mid Miocene climatic optimum, dinotherids were feeding on uh, softer foods, while in colder intervals, such as the late Miocene grassland expansion, it seems like it seems uh, like dinotherids increased uh, abrasive particles in their diet. What was also very interesting to see uh, here was uh, this interruption in the curve uh, right here where the arrow um, points, which uh, is actually synchronous with the introduction and the adaptive radiation of uh, new uh, browsing large mega herbivores in European paleo environments, which, which poss possibly shows that uh, Dinotherids were also very sensitive to uh, competition. And uh, the last point on uh, the curve, right here where the uh, arrow points, uh, shows that uh, right before the extinction of the family from European paleo environments, we had the higher intake uh, of abrasives in their diet. Now to conclude, uh, my results showed that dinotherids were indeed conservative browsers. However, they seem to have been sensitive to climate change with feeding on softer foods during warm intervals and slightly harder uh, foods during cold, colder intervals. They also, uh, they're also possibly uh, sensitive to resource partitioning and competition. And for the first time, it's visualized that this competition in combination with climate change were the possible causes of extinction of the family from European paleo environments. Before I finish my presentation, I would like to thank the Austrian Science Fund, the Synthesis Project, and the Austrian Paleontological Society for funding, University of Vienna for hosting me here during my PhD, and all the people who uh, were involved in this study with the one way or another. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you're all safe and healthy. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Uh, Okay, uh, so we have a, a question from Manabu Sakamoto. So he says, sorry if I missed this, but are the time-based correlations calculated using a time series regression? Uh, no, the, the, um, the, this is uh, be because we don't really have uh, actual dating for all the sites that, uh, that they were included. As a matter of fact, out of uh, these 80 something uh, uh, localities we have, uh, we have very precise uh, dating for maybe five of them. So th therefore I used um, I used the, the MN uh, zonation. So I used the mammal neotene uh, zones for Europe. And therefore uh, I just uh, used those middle points for every MN zone. And uh, this is how I, um, uh, this is how I divided my data in order to plot them right next to the, to the uh, paleo temperatures. Okay, brilliant. I think we have time for one more question. So uh, Lizzie Griffiths asked, uh, did you look at adult specimens or, uh, or were juveniles included? I did not include any juveniles. I did not include any uh, very old specimens because this is part of the screening 
uh, when we do microware analysis, we exclude very young and very old individuals. So I only included adults and uh, that was it. Okay, brilliant. Okay, thanks, Alexandros. So uh, there are a few more questions in the chat. So if you'd like to uh, like to direct some answers to them, uh, to the other people individually, that'd be great. Yes, uh, yeah, I would like to leave my email and Twitter here because I forgot to put it in my slides, I'm sorry. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, either email me or uh, find me on Twitter and ask me there. I'll be here all day long. Okay, you can also respond on the chat here as well. Ah, okay, perfect, great, thank okay. you. Okay, cheers, thank you. Yeah. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, so we'll shortly be uh, uh, hearing the final talk of this session from Holly Smith. Uh, so just wait uh, a couple of seconds until the clock rolls around until it, to 11.20 and we'll begin. So Holly uh, will be talking about high resolution rapid thermal neutron tomographic imaging of fossiliferous cave breaches from Southeast Asia. So take it away, thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Holly. I'm a PhD candidate at the Australia Research Centre for Human Evolution at Griffith University in Australia. And this research forms part of my thesis. Now my research location is Southeast Asia because the tropical climate and the geological evolution of the region created a rich paleo history throughout the Pleistocene. I study caves because these in the tropics are a site of natural accumulation for sediment and faunal remains. And in particular, I study an area in Western Sumatra called Padang. Now, the reason for this is when I did my literature review, previous cave studies advertised that the most faunal remains were often found in caves in karstic limestone hills and towers from approximately sea level to 100 metres above sea level. And during a survey in the Padang Highlands of Western Sumatra, three key localities were chosen because this was in fact found to be correct. Around 100 metres above sea level in the limestone hills, there was an abundance of fossil bearing cave deposits in Lida Aya, Naulu Gubin and Naulu Sampit. Now, these fossil bearing deposits are called breccia. And they are calcareous, uh, dense, indurated clastic deposits. They cement onto the walls and floors of the cave. They are found only in remnants because a lot of it is ripped away by water action. You can see in image A, a typical breccia deposit from Lida Aya. These are often comprised of large angular limestone clasts, as you can see in image B, and isolated bone fragments and isolated teeth. As you can see, there's a deer tooth in image C. Now, direct dating of these clasts can provide a chronological framework of depositional history. However, the complicated histories of breccia can lead to temporal mixing. This directly affects the calculated ages and contemporaneity of the remains within. Now, this can lead to significant dating inaccuracies. And a key issue is that contextual information regarding these sites is really lacking. And the aim of my PhD is a non-destructive contextual taphonomic study of the breccia. I want to understand the sediment infilling and depositional histories. Um, this has never been addressed before. Breccia have only ever been described in the literature in two dimensions, restricted to the surface of the deposit um, in very brief field notes in the field. Now we've seen just in this conference alone how important CT scanning is in uh, paleontology. But for fossil remains that have been cemented into such dense matrices, such as these breccia, you need a much higher penetration capability. And so we use the Rapid Thermal Neutron Tomographic Imaging Station, colloquially known as DINGO, at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation um, in Sydney, Australia. Now, this uh, machine can see a lot more, um, which we weren't sure of at first. A lot of people said, oh, these are homogenous. There's there's no evidence of stratigraphy or detail in there. You're not going to see anything. Um, but the results were absolutely fabulous. We've fully studied the internal geometry of these deposits. Um, the results are a huge success. Um, time restricts me to showing the success of this study with only uh, one individual deposit from each of the cave sites. Uh, we initially took 15 by 15 centimetre blocks because this was the maximum that uh, Dingo could handle at the time. Um, we had to dry them out for a number of weeks because there was such a heavy water content that even Dingo couldn't handle them. We took one discrete uh, block from each of the breccia remnant deposits in each of the three sites, making 13 in total. 
You can see here one of the samples from Leader Aya. You can see why people assume that the matrix is homogenous. There's no evidence of any stratigraphy or uh, bedding or layering in there. The two isolated uh, limestone clasts you can see, but you can't tell their internal interrelationships. And we were pretty sure that something was just poking out of that bottom right corner there, but we weren't sure of what it was. With a single slice uh, through the neutron scan, uh, we could see a matrix is uh, quite thick, muddy sediment with a large carbonate class. So this is a carbonate mudstone. There's two large angular limestone clasts in there. They're imbricated, which if you imagine domino tipping, um, which shows that they've been influenced by water flow, as has the fossil tooth below. Um, there's evidence, um, again, for water and dissolution because there's such a large amount of void space. None of these clasts are touching one another. The void spaces throughout the internal of the large uh, limestone clasts is actually evidence for crinoids and brachiopods, which confirms the Permian Carboniferous age of this limestone. So this is intraformational. This was um, the same age and same content as the uh, host limestone of the cave. And you can see on the left corner there, a speleotherm. It's really exciting. We can actually see the annual growth layers um, from the uh, waxing and waning of water. Knowing the orientation in which we can slice this because of Dingo, we are hoping to extract a Milankovitch cycle and actually know the climate in which this was formed. Now for Dalugupin, this became heavily unconsolidated upon drying. Um, you can see just a gritty soil material and most of the plaster of Paris couldn't be removed. But from a single slice here, again, through the centre, you can see there's four separate fabrics, each separated by a different neutron density. And um, the reason for this won't be known until we take some uh, thin section slices. Uh, fabric B and D have had much more water running through them. There's a lot more void space. Uh, they also are the two fossiliferous fabrics. We can see in fabric B, this is an isolated porcupine tooth. And in D, it's a porcupine bone and a cervid tooth. These are quite angular remains. Um, so they haven't been transported far. And a second slice, two centimetres further in, you can see a lot of isolated bone fragments. The long axes all have one unimodal direction, uh, which led us to taking samples at Nalu Sampit. Um, you can see here these uh, angular clasts. They are much more different uh, shapes, colours and textures. This seems a lot more complex, but again, the interrelationships can't be told from the surface of the deposit. A uh, clean slice straight through the centre. You can see once again, you have this unidirectional class orientation, which is even more fascinating. If you look very closely, you can see that before the void space, which separates the class from the outer cement, there's a thin layer of cement which lies around them. And um, this is actually key evidence that some of these clasts uh, actually belong to a primary breccia. They've been eroded away, transported and redeposited into a secondary breccia, which is really important for these dating inaccuracies that we were talking about before. And again, there's strong evidence for water flow because we can see just on the um, outer left corner of the deposit here, there's a small fossil shell which isn't visible to the naked eye. Now, this led us to taking um, some numerical data. I had the unenviable task of measuring the uh, size, the shape, the orientation and the dip of every single class within each of the 13 breccia numbering into the thousands. Uh, we created a geometrical dimensions one sample function on the left here where the red line denotes mean angle and on the right a spherical function stereo plot where red denotes a high commonality of clasts and blue denotes few. Now, at first, we thought this was um, representing fluvial depositional angle and paleocurrent, but since I handed in these slides, we've had a great deal more data come in. Um, we've actually discovered that this is related to cone formation, so each individual breccia cone. Um, so we can relate this to the geological and taphonomic data we already have. And it's quite fascinating. We now have information on the catalyst, the origin, the progression, the interplay, the lithification and the post-depositional de post alteration of these deposits, which is a much more detailed history than we ever thought we would have. And you can see here, we find that all of the uh, cones are consistently between three and 49 degrees north, and the slope varies in much greater detail from nine to 54 degrees and nine to 68 degrees east-west. Now, this uh, will be able to be placed within the maps and cave plans that we took in the field. Related to the orientation, direction and uh, excavation point uh, at the time, 
and we'll be able to map out the flow and interplay of each of these individual breccia over 80,000 years ago. Once again, for Nalu Gubin, we found out that uh, consistently through time, these flows were between 1 and 20 degrees south and the slope predominantly westerly from 3 to 77 degrees. Now, this was the beginning of the key evidence that this was actually related to cone formation rather than paleo current. You can see here the depositional angle is bimodal, which is really unusual for any paleo current flow. Um, this led us to go back and look for some other red herrings as uh, geological and taphonomic evidence, uh, which confirmed our findings. Um, this one here is 189 degrees north. It's uh, much more diverging. What we have here, rather than looking at the progression and formation, we've taken a sample directly where two separate cones are originating. So the slope, again, uh, much more variable at 484 degrees east and 3 to 50 degrees west. Uh, in conclusion, we've created a much more thorough examination of formation, preservation and degradation in these sites. It forms a much higher resolution chronology of site depositional phases than any direct dating, even in combination. And we formed a more complete interpretation of these cave deposits than any conventional method. And we've actually managed to reconstruct a complex taphonomic history from the fossil assemblages within and the diagenesis of the sediments in which they're held. I'd like to thank everybody on this list for their really valuable input. And on this particular occasion, uh, a special mention to the Oxford Museum of Natural History for hosting me last year. It really improved my skills before I headed out into the field. Thanks, everyone. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much, Holly. So do we have any questions? Remember to uh, type your questions in the chat. So I have one quick question. So, um, so what is, is there anything that sort of um, uh, sort of makes uh, this neutron imaging more complicated, like uh, like we saw really with the presence of hematite in the samples? If you have really dense minerals and things like that, is that also a problem for for this neutron tomography? Um, none of the internal clasts and inclusions, none of the bedding or anything like that, was an issue. The only issue was water content. They were so heavily flooded with water that um, we actually broke Dingo the first time that we used it, actually refracted the beams right off and um, blew a hole in the side of the machine. But it was actually um, quite lucky that we did that because uh, when they got funding to fix Dingo, um, the sample size increased majorly, so we actually got a much bigger sample in there second time round, and we also knew to put it in the oven for the two weeks that Dingo was being fixed, and it came out crystal clear. It was perfect. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so we have another another uh, another question from Neil Adams. So he's, he asks, uh, do you think it's possible to do this with relatively unconsolidated cave deposits too? Yes, the um, the Nalu Gubin deposits were really heavily unconsolidated. As long as you use plaster of Paris to retain the integrity, um, it, there's absolutely no problem with taking images at all. Okay, brilliant. So, oh, uh, oh, yeah, we have one. We have one more question. So, uh, John Marshall says, interesting talk. Uh, are you entirely in the Vado zone? So, little breccia cones are valid, uh, uh, unlike phreatic, where circulation can even reverse. Um, we're not actually sure yet because it's. I think it was about two days ago that we've actually realized that this, this was related to cone formation and we haven't actually completed our analysis of every single one of the breccia yet. So when we place that inside the uh, the cave maps and plans that we've formed, we'll probably know a little bit more about it. Um, it's it's completely brand new to me, John, so I'll, I'll get there. But look for the paper next year. <laughs> okay, brilliant. We still have time for, uh, for another question if anybody... Uh... If anybody has something that they'd like to ask, uh, if not, you can uh, you can always uh, discuss this in the chat uh, later on. Yeah, and I'll put my uh, email and my Twitter into the chat as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So uh, I think we're actually ready to wrap up the session there. Then, if there's no if there are no further questions, so I'd just like to thank all of the speakers again for their fantastic presentations this morning and uh, and all of the uh, the fascinating conversations that we've had in the chat as well. So it's been really great to see. Uh, so uh, yeah, we we're now having a break until um, uh, until eleven fifty. So I hope to see you all uh, in in the next session. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, yeah, let's leave it there.